So, um, last time we saw uh, a decomposition of the figure 8 not complement uh, into this 2 tetrahedra. So, um, we will see some more examples and a general algorithm of how that is done, but before I go to the examples, um, I just want to put up some um, couple of theorems uh, in uh, for hyperbolic knots or hyperbolic 3 manifolds uh, and a very important operation called Dan surgery which we have not really seen. So, I just need to put up this couple of theorems before we go on to see the examples, because it, it, it describes a very important phenomena in hyperbolic 3 manifolds which I think all of you should see before. So, um, so the first part is uh, dense surgery So, what then surgery the surgery part here what this means is you drill out something and then fill in something. So, it is drilling plus filling and the joke is like dentistry. Like dent. <laughs> So, it is drilling and filling. So, what are we drilling and filling? The idea is we drill out. So, let us let us start with you have some knot in S 3 and this can be done in more generality with links and so on, but, but let me just simplify notation uh, etcetera. So, let us just look at look at a knot in S 3 and you have this is a neighbor, regular neighborhood, this is a regular neighborhood of k which looks like a solid torus and we are removing the interior of it. So, you have a manifold with, with torus boundary. So, the idea is that uh, the drilling is uh, you drill out a regular neighborhood of k. So, that is a solid torus from, from S 3 and you fill in fill in a solid torus glued along the boundary, glued along boundary of M. So, if you take out a solid torus you glue it back, but now there are many ways to glue back a solid torus. So, uh, that is just I want to introduce the idea and the word called slope. So, uh, you have this regular neighborhood looks like a solid torus is d 2 cross s 1 and so we have this meridian. So, the meridian looks like the boundary of the disc cross 1. Uh, note that your, your, your knot is actually 0 cross s 1 right. So, and this is your solid torus neighborhood and this here is your meridian that is your meridian mu and now you take your uh, longitude. So, what is the longitude? it is any longitude such that any curve such that mu and lambda is a basis uh, for your h 1 of boundary of m right the h 1 of the torus. So, it is a basis for this. So, typically you could take this as this curve something which is parallel, but you there are many other choices. Right. For knots there is a canonical longitude, but I do not want to get into the canonical basis. Okay. There is a way you can pick out lambda uniquely, but let, let, me, let me not get into that. There is a linking number and so on coming, coming into. So, okay. so, what we are going to do is now 
when we fill in this solid torus, we have a choice of where to send our disk. And we send our disk to a curve which looks like P lambda, uh, P mu plus Q lambda. So, uh, so the curve P mu plus Q lambda is what we are going to call the den filling slope. That is the parameter of our den filling slope p over q and this belongs to uh, rational numbers union infinity okay so this is this is my curve on my boundary of m so this is exactly what the slope is this is the filling slope it's a rational number now what is my den field manifold my den field manifold is I indicate this as MPQ and this is exactly uh, you take your M as 3 minus a neighborhood and you now uh, fill in like so such that your boundary of the disk is going to go to is going to go to this curve this this P over Q curve okay so you get back some different manifold. So here is, so you can do this similar for links. So what you are effectively doing is on the boundary you are killing in the fundamental group, you are killing this P by Q curve in pi 1, okay, of the, of the new manifold. So I am just, I am just showing you for not complements, but you can also do den filling uh, for, uh, so, so this is the filling part. We can also also den filling for manifolds with boundary. Filling for manifolds with torus boundary. With to torus boundary. Many components you can do this. So here is an example. So here is your unknot, and if you do a zero filling or a zero den surgery, so you are removing a solid torus and gluing it back, well that is my basis for the unknot, then you get some manifold, if you do, so zero is basically zero or one, so you are killing the longitude here, um, here you do infinity which is one over zero, you will get some manifold, if you do a P over Q den filling, then you will get some manifold. Of course, the blanks are for you to discuss and think about it, what is really going on, because the complement of the unknot is a very simple manifold. And so, you now you are just making sure what your framing is, and now you are filling in and, and see what you, what you get back. So, why is then filling important? It is a very fundamental theorem of licorice independently by Wallace. It says that every closed connected oriented 3 manifold, every closed connected orientable uh, 3 manifold uh, is, can be obtained as an integral then filling. Integral just means that the coefficients are just integers. So, as an integral den surgery, not filling den surgery, on a link in S3. Right, so that makes why knots, are link, knots and links are so important to the study of three manifolds is because of this theorem. And the proof by licorice is very, very nice proof. And uh, there are, it's done in almost all books on three manifolds. The proof I really like is the one given in Ralston. Yes, you could do plus or minus one. Yeah, you could you could ramp this theorem up in many ways. 
he says that instead of integral, you can make your link more complicated and b make the integral to plus or minus one surgery. Plus or minus one surgery, yeah. By making the link more complicated. No, it's far from unique, and and this theorem really uh, uh, led to the whole quantum invariance, which you have been hearing about. This, the, it led to Kirby calculus, and from Kirby calculus, it kind of led to applications for four manifolds, uh, and then also to quantum invariance. So it's a, it's like a. Do you want to add any comments? The, the Likers' fundamental idea is using a Higard splitting and surface homeomorphisms and making this one step of the, of the Den twist on the, on the surface homeomorphism and how you can interpret Den twist in terms of three manifold topology. The proof is actually surprisingly simple, but the theorem is like very, the, the, yeah, the proof is not very complicated. It's this very brilliant idea of how to see the dent twist as a dense as a dent surgery, and and as I said, many books do it, but I th I, I really like Dralson's treatment. He gives very nice pictures. surgery representation. It's called Kirby calculus. So now, this is the he who was at Johns Hopkins? I do not know where he was. <laughs> this is at 60, this is in 62. Likurish is also proved in Liquid this. Independently. independently, yeah. Licorice did it later. Later. Well, I think it's called Ligurish's Wallace theorem, but okay. The uh, Ligurish also proves that the mapping class group is generated by Dan Twist because he uses that. Oh, this is the same theorem for which you use. Uh, well, that was that was known to Dan, but Ligurish gives another independent proof that the mapping class group is generated by Dan Twist, and then uses that for Higard splittings. Every manifold has a Higard splitting. And then uses the dent twist as a dent surgery. Very, very nice and not very difficult. All right, this is proof is not as easy as that. All right, so this is the Thurston's version of now what happens when you do dent surgery. So I'm just going to state it for uh, just for one cusp, but this is, it, it follows for uh, more cusps also. For, I'm just going to the for one because the statement is much easier. So you have uh, let M be hyperbolic three manifold. It's a non-compact manifold with one cusp. Um, then, so you want to understand what happens when you den fill this thing. There exists a finite set A in Q such that if P or Q, the slope is not in A, then this manifold MPQ is hyperbolic. The second thing it says is that 
the volume drops the hyperbolic volume drops here and the third thing which is the most very interesting consequence is that this is hyperbolic manifold and how are you actually getting uh, this manifold it is actually a deformation. So, we just saw in Kate's talk we saw the character of uh, uh, the whole character variety and, and, and we looked at this com component of the character variety which contains the complete the faithful uh, uh, the character uh, the uh, discrete faithful character. And so, right around that representation are various representations which are corresponding to M P Q. So, this is M P Q is a, is a closed manifold which is obtained by deforming the representation for M and by deforming the, the, the algebra of the deformation now translates to geometry that this actually is a this geometrically converges to M as as p say as say as p squared plus q squared goes to infinity. And so, a consequence of the geometric convergence is really that one of the consequences that you actually get volume convergence. So, now you, you get uh, limit points in the set of volumes. So, so, let me just give you an example of what, what, this, what this means. What is that? It is all for p q belonging to here, this is because this has to be hyperbolic otherwise it would not make sense. Yeah. Uh, those are called exceptional surgeries and then you may you may not get um, you may not. So, quantifying the set A has led to a lot many many papers and those are exceptional surgeries on the knot or on the manifold and you could get non hyperbolic manifolds. So, what happens to condition 3? Condition 3 the volume of non hyperbolic thing I mean you zero. cannot talk of volume 0, but yeah. Zero. yeah. But, but since there is a finite set I mean it does not affect the convergence. Uh, 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 yeah there are all kinds of bounds on, on, on how big A can be yes as I said there is a lot of work gone into quantifying how, how big A is yes. So, uh, so this gives non trivial geometric limits as well as limit points of the volume uh, note that there are there are no uh, limit points of volume of hyperbolic volume for dimensions n not equal to 3. So, this is an exclusively dimension equal to 3 phenomena. So, um, so here is an example the example is going to start with another exercise. Okay. So, note that if I take this surgery presentation okay so now you have some tangle here take any two tangle here what this is equal to is you are adding 2n full twist here so this is your 2n cross x sorry n full twist so 2n cross x All right. So, what happens is if I if I call this not k n, yeah, then what what Thurston's theorem is saying is that this implies that volume of volume of s three minus k n is converging as n approaches infinity. To what does it converge? It converges to the volume uh, volume of the link obtained by basically as n goes to infinity you recover the cusp right. So, um, so what you are getting is so for example, you get the twist knots which we saw in a few talks then the first day Ramadevi was talking about twist knots. So, in particular you get, so if T is equal to is if, if T is this tangle then K n are the twist knots 
and now you get your volume of the twist knots goes to the white head link. So W is the white head link, which is which is this link. Yes. So so when you're doing dense surgery, you have this cusp. And so you have this, this cusp is actually, there's a z plus z, which is acting as parabolic elements. And when you're doing the insertion, you're effectively filling in a very short curve over here. So you are, you're, you're cutting this off. You're, you're, you're cutting off this, of this cusp, and that's why that volume is dropped. And you're adding, to complete it, you're adding like a very short curve. Very adding a very short geodesic, and the geodesic you're adding, uh, it it corresponds to uh, say uh, uh, R S, where your P Q R S, this determinant is one. So you have this this link here. So what happens is that the Z plus Z subgroup, which is parabolic, now becomes a, a, a logodromic subgroup, and the and it becomes a, it has only two fixed points, so it it acts on axis. And that's exactly the, the, the uh, well. It will depend on the choice of the bases and so on. This is just general manifold, yeah. Yeah, that's the deformation. You're going from a non-compact manifold to a to a. Z, Z plus Z, you reduce to Z. Yes. Yes. From Z plus Z. You're reducing to z because the 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 cusp torus now becomes a tube, and so you're reducing from z plus z to a z. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 That's right, and that's why you do you in surfaces you do not get non-trivial volume uh, limits. You you have discrete spectrum. Uh, so, so talking about spectrum, here is what some consequences of this, what is called Thurston-Jorgensen theory, which is all about deformation theory of, of uh, uh, three manifolds. So what it, what, what it gives you is a structure of, um, of the set of hyperbolic volumes, three-dimensional volumes. So I'm going to call this wall, and so the first is that wall is well ordered. Second is so that means there is a least element, etc. For all alpha belonging to wall, there exist only finitely many manifolds with that number. With volume equal to alpha, and the third is it describing what the order type of wall is. So the order type of wall is the is the ordinal number omega to the power omega. So what does that mean? Is you if you look at uh, so this is your real numbers. You have a least element, right? And now you have some, then there's a next least element, next least element, and then they, they, they start accumulating, and it gives you the first cusp manifold, the lowest cusp manifold. And now then there is the next cusp manifold, next cusp manifold, and they start accumulating, and then you get the next two cusp manifold, and so on. So that is what the structure is. And so you get limit points or limit runs. That way you get n cusp manifolds. Uh, for a long time, uh, there were conjectures about what these elements were. Many of those conjectures are, are now proved. This is what is called the Weeks manifold. This is proved by Gabay and Meyerhoff and Milley. Uh, this is the figure eight knot. Figure eight knot complement, and it has a sister. I bet you didn't know. <laughs> there was a sister manifold to the figure eight. Uh, the two cusp is 
is the white head link complement and there is a sister also and uh, it is not known maybe maybe for it's known what is the least four cusp manifold or something but in general these things are not known there is also a lot of relations between arithmetic uh, uh, hyperbolic three manifolds because for uh, reasons <laughs> these manifolds happen to be arithmetic there is there is a huge amount of arithmetic uh, uh, three manifolds kind of uh, not, uh, comes in where this low volume manifolds hap happen to be arithmetic manifolds. So, uh, what, uh, does this mean like uh, as the volume increases the number of cusps increases? Uh, the other way as the number of cusps incre increases the volume increases. The volume is bounded below by the number of cusps yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They will, they will, they can have more volumes. That's fine, and they will also, they will also converge and have limit points and so on. Yeah. So the 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 structure is it just keeps going. You have omega for and so on, omega squared, omega cube. All right. So this is the volume spectrum. It's not discrete. It has a lot of nice limit points. It is well ordered. And and the, like the first ten manifolds are conjectured. Maybe the first seven are proved. And so, very, very interesting theory about this. No, no, I did not say that at all. No, not at all. Ravenel? Ravenel? No, no, not Ravenel. It was, it was done by Meyerhoff and Kao and Ian did the Whitehead link, and Weeks manifold was proved uh, by Gabai, Meyerhoff, and Milley. Yeah, that was a lot. Lot of people were trying this lower bound stuff. Okay, I hope you have filled in these this this chart. No, no, I'm not going to give the answers. I I don't want to risk making a reciprocal error. <laughs> <laughs> there is always p by q and q by p. I think I think. <laughs> maybe maybe in discussions we can discuss this. I, I want them to think about the how the how the Lens so, and all, all that. yes that's right. <laughs> all right, so now now go, let's come to examples of how to triangulate link complements. So this is done by Manasco and um, by Aitchinson. Uh, looms then and Rubinstein. So what is the idea? So the idea is you have some some knot diagram, you have a link L and you have some diagram D and I think of this as sitting on S2, which I'm going to think of as the board. This is going to be sitting on S2. Uh, well, we'll do that later, but now I'll draw a little bit of, uh, uh, of different pictures. And the diagram, uh, there is an over and under crossing information. So just except at the over and under crossing, we expect everything to be lying on the plane. But except at the, at the crossing, it will just jump up and down. So um, what we want to do is, uh, the the to get to get a polyhedral decomposition so you get two polyhedra uh, which glue up to get uh, s3 minus l okay that is the goal and what's a polyhedra a polyhedra is a three ball with a finite graph on its boundary, on boundary of this three bar. Okay, that's that's basically what I mean by polyhedral. So what we want to do is we want to take this, the, take this picture of the of the knot diagram, and now you want to extract this polyhedra from it. So you want to convert somehow this diagram into a uh, and make it flat. Uh, 
uh, well, right now, let I, I'm going to. Uh, it, it can have two gone. We'll deal with the bygones. We will deal with the bygones in one step. So, um, so here is what it looks like. So now we are we are going to look at a crossing, right? So you have a crossing. So you have a crossing here. And what we are going to do is put in an edge here. That's going to be edge of the polyhedra. Now notice that the components of the knot, the components of the knot are not going to be, the components of the knot are at infinity. They're vertices. Okay, so we need to come up with a way to push this out. So the vertices are, so vertices of this polyhedra are components of of d and what are the edges the edges are this crossing edges at every crossing at every crossing and now what are the faces the faces are the regions but what's interesting is uh, the, re the the these are the faces and now you can see that the face is, um, so here is the region, say from here, and then there is the region here, so regions of the knot diagram, and then there is the region over here, and there is a fourth region which I am not going to bother drawing, and I am going to call this A, B, C, and D. Okay, these are the regions. Now, what are the three faces or the or the or the three cells of this polyhedra? There's a there's a there is a three cell which lies on top of this, and there's a three cell which lies on the bottom. And this S2 is the common boundary of it. So you want to see a graph on this S2, this common boundary. So you need to somehow flatten this thing so that the edges are there, they're flattened, and this this uh, uh, this not uh, part or part of the link will is going to become a vertex. Okay, so that's the that is the idea. So the three cells are there is the 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 three balls of S three minus S two. Okay, so there is a top polyhedron and and a bottom polyhedron. So what I want to to uh, get from this picture, I'll draw another picture of how, how the next step occurs. But in this picture, notice that what the adjacency is. So from top, your A and D are adjacent from the, from the, uh, for, no, no, A and D are not. The, from the top, your, your A and B are adjacent from the top polyhedron. And, but from the bottom polyhedron, you, you can see that your A and D are adjacent. So that is the key point. So from top, your A and B are adjacent. And also C and D. This is at every crossing. And from, from the bottom, your A and D are adjacent. And also. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to tell you. Yeah. So, right. So, so you just have to. So when you're when the two things are coming over, over here, you can see that this 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 strand is the is is the undercrossing, and so they are directly adjacent right over here from here along this edge, whereas they are not because there is this over strand here. But now, if you look from if you look from the uh, bottom polyhedron, this over strand is not there. Now it's become an under strand. So now A and D are adjacent, but not these two. Okay. So now you can reflect this by doing a little move on the uh, on this picture. And so there is one move on the top and the one move on the bottom. And what you are doing is you are pushing this edge onto the under strand. So from the top, you are pushing it on the under strand. And from the bottom polyhedra, you are pushing it on the on the on the over strand. So what you are doing is, 
the top polyhedron x plus of d So it's the same edge. So notice that if you actually identify this edge, uh, there's an orientation, but I'm not. I'm completely ignoring orientation here. It doesn't matter. So if you identify this, you'll get back that picture. So this is from the top. Yeah. Huh? Orientation of the edges. Yeah. You don't really. The, the you, you can have, but it, I'm I'm not. I'm not. I'm ignoring that. Okay. And so, for the for the bottom polyhedron, you are doing exactly the opposite way. And again, you have the same faces. So this is again the edge E. That's right, and now we are flattening it. We are basically splitting the edge and flattening it over here, like like so. Yeah. So I should actually make this. Yeah. So that's actually a vertex, right? So if you do this at every crossing, and notice that these knot strands are going to become smaller and smaller, and if you extend the edges, you can think of this uh, components of the of the link as as some vertices, right? So. And now you are you are you are getting your edges as you want and so on, but what's important is what is the gluing. So let's look at what the gluing is. So the gluing is A gets glued to A, of course, but it cannot it doesn't get glued straight because notice that this edge is now actually over here. It's the same edge. So you need to when you identify A to A, you need to switch this and you need to turn it clockwise. Okay, when you identify D to D, notice that it needs to be turned anti-clockwise now. So when you go up over here, it needs to be turned anti-clockwise. Ninety degrees or what? Uh, it depends. It, there is no degrees because this is all combinatorial. Yeah, yeah. But maybe if it's n gone, then two up two pi by n. Right. This 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 picture doesn't end. I'm just zooming in on this crossing. So there are mo there is more things around here. So, and the same thing for C and for B. I can I can put in the arrows, but it may get a little confusing, right? So, so you also glue over here with some with some orientation. Again, you do uh, you do clockwise over here, and here you do anti-clockwise for the B and so on, right? So you do this everywhere. So now what we have. So, so the steps are. Let me just explain what the steps are. There are four steps here. No, it's not a matter of problem. I'm just I've just changed this three-dimensional picture to a two-dimensional picture by pushing on the, of the edge. Yeah, yeah. That is that is something which you just need to think about because from the from the top polyhedron, this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, another way to do this is you take a regular neighborhood of this, you remove the torus, and then you can see how from the top this torus is below here, and now so that's a truncated polyhedron, um, and and these two edge, these two uh, faces are adjacent, oh, from or from this edge. Whereas these two are not, because from uh, as you are looking down from here, there is this torus in between. So you need to thicken it up. Okay. Yeah, but you need to give it some thought. That is the critical part. Okay. This this part. There is no tetrahedra anywhere here right now. There is no. I did not say anything about a tetrahedra. It's all a polyhedron decomposition. Yeah, okay. no tetrahedra yet. Okay. So, so the step one. Is is do this flattening, do flattening, right? So for for your x plus and minus d at every crossing, right? 
step 2 is going to be you you retract your retract not diagram or link diagram retract strands of d of d to vertices so you see now we are building our polyhedra cell by cell you have the zero cell you have the one cell now you have the two cells which are the regions and now you have to do the, have the three cells but the three cells have to do um, so step 3 is the gluing so 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 the faces faces are glued as as explained yeah like so right the, the, like gears with this gear sort of um, uh, twisting and the the last the the last step the last step is going to be uh, equal to uh, you divide now divide the polyhedra uh, into tetrahedra so now which you can do in any way you want step four. i missed step 4 <laughs> the step 4 is dealing with the bygones okay so because <laughs> what happens is um, when you do this procedure a priori you will get bygones and so if you want to do for combinatorial purposes that is fine because right now this is a combinatorial decomposition but when you want to make any geometry on it you cannot have bygones right because there are no there are the, the, the lowest polygon is a triangle no bygone right so so you if you want to do any geometry you need to get rid of bygones so so you the step 4 is actually collapse bygones collapse bygones and identify edges the corresponding edges on the bygones so what we get is the theorem by by menasco and hinson etc is that your s3 minus l is equal to this and this is glued along faces by rotation glued along faces by rotation there is a very nice proposition here if you have if your diagram is alternating then this polyhedron which is just given by the by the graph on on its on the boundary of the three ball is exactly the projection of the link so the proposition is that if your d is reduced alternating diagram then uh, then the one skeleton then the one skeleton of both x plus or minus d uh, is same as uh, the projection graph of d Could be multiples of pi by n. Uh, again, uh, pi by n is really uh, there is no geometry really. I understand yeah, that. yeah. So you could have you could have, yes. I'm going to just show you. Multiples, not, not just two pi by n. Uh, it's it's like a ratcheting. It's like the this phase ratchets this way, this phase ratchets the other way. So just because uh, you don't glue them right, if you just glue them A to A directly, you'll just get better case three. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So then they'll ratchet just one. It's just once. Once only. Yeah, only once. Only once. Because if you ratchet more, then you'll you'll get this. Take this edge somewhere else. It's only one. Once it has to ratchet. Yeah, we'll see in the example. So the example is going to be. the famous link boromian rings 
this is an alternating link Okay. And now what we will do is we will put in the crossing edges. Um, okay. And now we will draw, we will do one steps one and two together. Okay. So, um, the step 4 does not need to, we do not worry about it because, yes. Uh, yes, they share the edge E, you are right, but you sh they share the edge E when your diagram D is 3 dimensional. Yeah, but when I want to convert the diagram into 2 dimensional like that, then f look f if as seen from the top only A and B share the edge. That, that copy of the edge. See that edge goes to four instances, right? One to above and one to below. So from seeing from above, A and B share that edge, like so. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a theorem. It takes it takes some explanation to actually see that the procedure I've described, the gluing gives you exactly S three minus L. Yeah. So now we are ready to write down. All right. So, notice what the proposition is. It says that if your if your diagram is alternating, uh, then my my uh, one skeleton is same as the as the as the not projection. So that means that my one skeleton is exactly like this. It almost feels like I'm not doing anything because somehow I have just told you things that I do not need to do any work. But the way it works is you think about this, this edge and you push it down and then this splits like so. And you push this edge, you push it down on the under strand and from, from bottom you push it down on the over strand like that. So that is exactly what is going on in that picture. So you keep, you keep doing this. I am not going to make these things red, but I am going to mark. So these are that, that, that this is now the knot. Okay. The vertices are the link now. And what are the numbers? My numbers, now these are all edges and my numbers look like this. If you do like a few examples, you will, it's, it's not very hard. And this is one, right? So this is the this is the polyhedron. There are edges and vertices and so on, right? And then you do the same thing over here. Now they go off the other way. One one goes like this on the top. Then one one will go like this on the bottom, right? That's exactly. I'm just following that procedure. So I have one one. I have five five. Okay, and and here are my um, my faces, my A, B, C, D, E, F, and this is X and this is Y, and again the same thing. You have your A, B, C, uh, D, E, F, and X and Y. So now you can see, for example, take A. You can see that this needs to be. Uh, uh, this needs to be rotated clockwise once in order to match this face. And then you lo look at your E and this needs to be rotated anti-clockwise once in order to match this thing. You see the numbering on the on the edges? Right, see 154, this is 154. Right, so it just needs to be rotated. So that is going to be the gluing. So this is steps one and two. Uh, 
there are no bygones, so steps four is free. Step five is now you can uh, now you can uh, 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 decompose this into tetrahedra. But what what polyhedron is this? Can anyone guess what polyhedron is this? Let's see. I see all triangular faces. Yes, octahedron. This these two are octahedra. These are both they're they're octahedra. So your Borromean link complement is actually a union of two octahedra. And now you can you can um, um, decompose the octahedra into four tetrahedra, write down the gluing equations, etc. But there's a simpler procedure. Notice that what is the valency of every edge here? How many times do you see your, uh, any number? Yes? Four. Right? Every edge has valency 4 and so you have an octahedron, a hyperbolic ideal octahedron which is regular. Every edge, every dihedral angle is pi by 2 and 4 times pi by 2 is 2 pi. So maybe that will work out and it actually does work out. So what happens is that you take the regular hyperbolic octahedra uh, with pi by 2 dihedral angles. And now what happens is that volume of S3 minus B, this is your what is my, my Borromean rings B, is actually union of um, is two is 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 uh, two regular octahedra ideal glued together. And so uh, the volume, sorry, sorry, I'm, I don't mean the volume. And so then the volume of this is two times v oct, right? This is this number came up last time when we were doing the Lobachevsky function. All right. So in the last five minutes, I want to just show you what to do when there are bygones, which will come. We'll go back to the figure eight knot. Any questions? You have to uh, read this again and think about this. Like I, I, just, I almost didn't do anything. Just like drew the same pictures and like have convinced you that from a knot, which is there, we have gone to its complement with the same picture. But trust me, it does work. <laughs> so, example number two. <laughs> for me at least. <laughs> yeah, that's what the discussion session is for. <laughs> All right, so the next example. So what, what do we do about the bygones? Let bygones be bygones. Right, that's the joke. Right, so what we do is um, you have a, a bygone picture like this. And now you have this edge over here. So you have this edge, and now if you if you do this procedure, of of uh, 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 let me let me let me put it in a new different color here. So you have these two edges, right? So if you do this procedure, then on on the x plus, right, you are going to push this to the bottom strand, right? So you you get this like this. And here you are pushing it to the bottom strand. Uh, so, uh, well, this is the top strand here. So, when you push it to the bottom strand, it becomes like this. So, it becomes like this. All right. So, this is what this is what my bygone looks like in the polyhedron. And similar picture on the on the bottom. Now, when you have this thing on the polyhedron, you can identify. So, you identify. And so this just becomes one edge, right? Red, blue, and so there are actually three edges here. M notice that there is an. This is a vertex, right? And there is the red edge which goes like this, and there's a blue edge which goes like that. So when we flatten it and identify. Right, you actually get three edges which are identified, so the valency of edges increases immediately. 
you get this picture. That is what happens. So, let us just see how that happens on our second example. Right, so this is your figure eight knot, and we are going to have a. So this is going to be one three, and this is going to be two. And four. But I I hope I'm not messing up. I I used some colors yesterday, and I forget what colors I used. Uh, completely random. I am just numbering it so that at the end I get 1 and 2 which is what I used yesterday. You know what let me just see the see what what colors and numbers are used. I, I think this is correct. Yeah 2 or oh, that was 2 and this is. So, the colors are correct, but the numbers are wrong. So, you can you can refer back to your example from yesterday. So, let me use 2 4 here. Let me use one two. It doesn't. You'll, you'll see. It doesn't matter. It's just to make be consistent with la, yesterday's example. So again, this is alternating, right? So we can do steps one and two together. Um, and so your x d plus, and you get your x d minus. And what do you get? Uh, you 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 get your figure eight. But now no no problem with crossings, right? And now you number it out. And uh, so same thing over here, right? That's your polyhedron, but you have to still number it. So w w what do you number it? Um, Right. This is what you are numbering and you can see the bygone right here and the bygone right here and the same thing you number over here. And so, you have 2, 2, uh, 4, 4 and 1, 1 and 3, 3. Okay. That's the numbering, and again the faces are exactly glued. Um, and now we do step four. And what happens when we do step four is that we are now crushing the bygones. So you identify not all the instances of two and four. We just call it two. So then two H two becomes four and edge 1 becomes 3 right so now you get exactly the picture uh, i don't know if you if you saw the picture yesterday so this is a tetrahedron and you have uh, 2 2 1 1 1 2 right and again you have uh, 2 1, 2 and you have 1, 1, 2 and you can see that the, the tetrahedra are, are glued up and now you can do one more step and actually draw them as tetrahedron like we usually see, but, but you do not really need that. You can have, you, you can see they are all 6 valent edges and so on. So, you can set up your gluing equations. So, uh, I just want to add 2, uh, oh there are, there are, you, you can carry out this procedure on here are a couple of nice examples. Um, so, here is an exercise. So, one is do this for white head link, uh, but you use a different diagram than I showed you just some time back. The diagram you use for white head link is going to be uh, this diagram. So, that is your white head link, you use this diagram. The second link which I want you to use or not I wanted to use it 818, where do you see 818? This is actually the, the knot on this Ayuka poster outside. This is a very beautiful knot 
it has very ni very nice geometric properties it is the maximum volume among all eight crossing knots it is what we have studied this family in great detail in a couple of papers this is called is a part of the family called weaving knots um, and they have the uh, and it has uh, uh, this procedure when you do this it has no bygones and so when you do this procedure you actually get a polyhedron and you can put angles on it and realize it actually as a hyperbolic ideal polyhedron you have to figure out what the angles the hydral angles are and and uh, so it's a what is called completely realizable link very nice i i do not know why why ayuka liked it i i have my hyperbolic geometry reasons that i like this link um so uh, the one one last comment i want to make is um, there is a way to this procedure there is a way to change this procedure in order to get completeness equations also and and that's a little bit more involved what you have to work with is what is called truncated polyhedra so what we do is uh, say for example here is a picture so you use for completeness completeness equation uh, use truncated polyhedra truncated polyhedra and what that means is instead of this picture you actually uh, cut out a little square here at every part <coughs> and when you do that you will be able to see the identifications <coughs> and you can develop the cusp depending on the identification so once you can develop the cusp depending on the identification then you can write out see every edge here um, uh, when you when you do a ideal triangulation every edge has a parameter and then you develop the cusp and you can write down this completeness equation so that can be done and the second comment is uh, uh, snappy uses a, a triangulation which is called octahedral decomposition so what they what snappy does is uh, it puts an octahedron at every crossing. So, snappy, what it does is uh, octahedron, not hyperbolic, everything combinatorial. So, an octahedron at every crossing. And I don't know if I'll be able to draw this, but So it, it puts this octahedron at every crossing and that crossing edge which you have is exactly this crossing edge over here and uh, then it decomposes into this four tetrahedra and figures out what is the gluing as you are around in the face and once it gets that triangulation uh, then it does a bunch of two, two three moves uh, which take two tetrahedra glued along a face to three tetrahedra glued along an edge and then it simplifies the triangulation. There is only one issue with this triangulation, there are finite points in here, in this triangulation. It is not a completely ideal triangulation, there are finite points, so you have to resolve the finite points. And this, this triangulation is very nice and it has gotten some lot of attention in recent maybe past year or so. Uh, uh, so the, yeah, Colin Adams wrote some papers and Yokota and I think Sakuma wrote wrote some papers on this all right so let me stop here <coughs>
uh, uh, even if you will find some z i's on the real line uh, they sometimes call still geometric or even if you find some z i's in the complex plane except at 0 or, or 0 or 1 so non degenerate tetrahedra uh, you still call sometimes it is called geometric and the, the point is that the edges of the tetrahedra if you have these parameters then these edges of the tetrahedra uh, you are, they are they are homotopically non trivial and and that kind of enables you to do some very good group theory on the using the triangulation and so the question oh i should mention uh, a open problem is it is not known whether there for any given uh, any cusp hyperbolic three manifold if there exists an ideal triangulation it is of course known for various classes of knot complements link complements um, it is way uh, uh, an ideal triangulation with with all tetra all tetrahedra in the upper half plane all positively oriented, oriented tetrahedra so uh, it is not known whether such a triangulation exists it is known that there exists a finite cover for which there is such a triangulation but the finite cover existence uh, 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 again it is not quantified how how big you want to you can go and um, and so this triangulation it was shown very recently by Sakuma and uh, Yoshida I think yeah I uh, that that this triangulation for alternating links actually gives you non degenerate tetrahedra. So that was like a, a two two different uh, uh, sets of authors showed it. It was one showed by uh, uh, Sakuma and, and and Yoshida using some cube complex um, related stuff, and it was also showed by uh, Garfulidis, Moffat, and Dillon using something else. I don't know what. So they did an actual genuine ideal triangulation. Uh, again. We, the the non degenerate meaning that the the z i's which you get they are not zero or one but they can be negative and so on and uh, as i said uh, uh, they are not necessarily in the upper half plane but what's not known is whether there exists an ideal triangulation with all z i's in the upper half plane that is not known and the procedure you have shown is it only for alternating links or no no for any links i am just doing alternating because of the proposition it saves me time to do it on the board. No, but this can be done for any links. But even this procedure, even for alternating links, you might still get flat here. Why would you need flat here? Because you need to you need to solve for gluing equations. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you may not get triangular faces and then yeah. you have to cut up the polyhedra and separate you may have to do yeah, that yeah. by adding some flat sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And how did you link up with that epsilon tunnel? Very good question. I was thinking of avoiding that. Very good question. Epstein Banner decomposition. So, it is known that every cusp hyperbolic 3 manifold uh, uh, has a de uh, there exists an uh, hyperbolic ideal polyhedron uh, whose faces can be glued up to get your uh, get this manifold. So, this this for one cusp manifold this polyhedron is canonical meaning that it is unique and this is called the Epstein Penner uh, decomposition or the Epstein Penner canonical decomposition and um, so you have a polyhedral decomposition why cannot you just get that get a, a tetrahedral decomposition is when you cut up your polyhedron into tetrahedra and when you glue along the faces you may not be able to do it in such a way that all the, the faces uh, 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 such that you are you are dividing the faces in different directions and so if you divide the faces in different directions you will end up getting flat tetrahedra. So, what the example is here is a square and if I divide this coming from one part like this and the other part if I divide like this that is a tetrahedron all right it is just flat the parameter z here is going to be belonging to r and so uh, all of Thurston's theory goes through for flat tetrahedra also. Um, so, there is no problem as such, but you know we still would like to have positively oriented tetrahedra and so that is still open. So, this decomposition is not related to the Epstein Penner 1, um, that is another uh, uh, question whether 
these edges are canonical. And there are examples where, for example, the figure 8 naught and the Borromean rings, all of the things which you have drawn, they are all nice examples because they are all arithmetic and all the nice things happen. I am just showing you nice things. I am not showing you all the scary stuff. So <laughs> these are all canonical edges, but that requires some work to prove. You need to compute four domains and take horospheres and so on. That's a, that's a good question. Oh, thank you. Thank you.